All right. In today's lesson, we'll be discussing um, the um, how to understand the how to understand the law. Um, I know I kind of skipped very rapidly through that, um, and a lot of this course is just to kind of explain simple things, give a survey of what's going on in the Old Testament and uh, help you be able to, to really delve in there for your own study. This is not meant to be an answer all video series. This is meant to be this is meant to be a class that gets people who have no understanding of the Old Testament into um, into studying it more. Get them into into seeing how it applies to them. So to that end, we're going to talk about the law. Now uh, first off the legal code goes from Exodus nineteen through Numbers ten and then contains a large portion of Deuteronomy. This is what's called the law and what causes a lot of a lot of irritation for Christians nowadays. Now, the law was given for many different reasons, physical, spiritual. Um, and it was given to different people types, individual or the priest. Um, there were things for a personal for one person there was the things things for the nation, okay? Um, now it's important to understand these differences. First off, physical. So there are things to keep the people healthy, to, to ward off diseases, that kind of stuff. You know, more done for physical aspects. There are some other things done for spiritual aspects, that the people would maintain cleanliness and holiness before the Lord. Um, there were differences between whose responsibility to do what, the individuals or the priests, you know, and it has breaks that apart. But then also. There were some things which were for the person, for their better being, but then there was things that were meant for the nation, for the whole, the, everybody's well-being. So, you know, understand the differences in, in, in what law was written for what. Um, it, it tells us how to become and stay holy, or told them how to become and stay holy, and showed that the holiness was because of God. Okay? Um, it, it, it showed the conditions for sacrifice. Remember, sacrifice wasn't, once again, wasn't unique to Israel. The, the other nations did do sacrifice as well. But with this, God shows the conditions for a holy sacrifice for him and how that contrasts. Um, <clears throat> uh, it also has the conditions for the representative who was, who was doing this, for the, for the worshiper, for the location, for the lifestyle. It gave conditions for for, for this, for conditions for the for the worship, um, and, and you know these are this is kind of important. How would they have known otherwise? Um, so why was the law given? First off, a revelation of God for all who would believe. Um, and there, uh, Leviticus says a few different things um, that I encourage you to look at. It'll help you help explain this. Um, but Galatians, I really want to look at um, Paul. Is seeing this is, uh, um, actually answers it. Why the law then? It was added because of transgressions, having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator until that seed would come to whom the promise had been made. Now a mediator is not for only one party only, whereas God is only one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? May it never be. For if a law had been given which was able to impart life, then righteousness would indeed have been based on law. But the scripture has shut up everyone under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before our faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith with, which was later to be revealed. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ, that we may be justified by faith. And he goes on uh, saying that, uh, but showing us the reasons as to why there is a benefit of the law. And if you would like more on that, a very good um, uh, survey, I guess, if you want to call it that, of the New Testament books, excluding the Gospels, is called From Pentecost to Patmos by Craig Blomberg. Um, I've been reading through it, and I just love it. Um, I don't, obviously, I don't agree with everything by Blomberg, but he definitely is He definitely is um, one of my favorite scholars. And I, I mean, pick up any of his books, and you won't be, you won't be disappointed. He has one on uh, uh, prosperity and poverty. Um, he has one called uh, Interpreting the Parables, which... I love, I love that one so much. But then uh, from Pentecost to Patmos, and he also has, uh, I guess you call it its companion, Jesus and the Gospels. Just two great, two great books. I, I highly recommend them. I mean, he, once again, you don't have to agree with someone completely to learn from them. Just uh, go check it out. Um, so the revelation of God for all who would believe. Leviticus 16.29, I, I, will, I will read some of this. Um, 
This shall be a permanent statute for you in the seventh month. On the tenth day of the month, you shall humble your souls and not do any work, whether the native or the alien who sojourns among you. Um, so, uh, showing of his character. Uh, speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, I am the Lord your God. You shall not do what is done in the land of Egypt. See, showing that there is a distinction between who he is and who other people claim God to be. Uh, 20, 6 through 8. As for the person who turns to mediums and to spiritists to play the harlot after them, I will also set my face against the person and I will cut him off from among his people. How do we know that these things are bad? Because God revealed of himself and said, this is, this is not of me. So, uh, also, to renew the fellowship. Remember, when man sinned in the Garden of Eden, there was a separation between man and God. But in order to do that, God made a way. I mean, in order to fix that, God made a way. So in 19.4-6 of Exodus, uh, it says, Now you yourselves have seen what I, what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and, uh, and keep my commandment, then you, will, you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. So God desired for them to have this, this relationship with himself. Um, it, it's only the, it's only later that it was turned into this whole thing of legalism, and then once again, now even today, Christians are still trying to make people Jewish by um, by demanding that they follow the letter of the law rather than understanding uh, rather than living by grace and following the the law of grace and love. Um, remember, they both came from the same person who never changes, and so what does that mean for us? Um, so Leviticus nine six to seven. Um, this is the thing which the Lord has commanded you to do, that the glory of the Lord may appear to you. Moses then said to Aaron, Come near to the altar and offer your sin offering and your burnt offering, uh, that you may take make atonement for yourself and for the people. Then make the offering for the people, that you may make atonement for them, just as the Lord has commanded. Um, so talking about how God wanted fellowship with them. And then in 1531, it talks about... Thus you shall keep the sons of Israel separated from their uncleanness, so that they will not die in their uncleanness by their defiling my tabernacle that is among them. Um, see what I mean? Because God was with them, he wanted them to live differently because he cannot stand that 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 um, that um, evil. He cannot stand to be in the same place as evil. So also to give knowledge of morals, uh, personal and national. Um, and also, by the way, not, apart from morals, to also give, give what, is, what is clean and unclean. Uh, for instance, blood not being a good thing to eat. Um, Leviticus 19, 9-12. Uh, now when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap the very corners of your field, nor shall you gather the gleanings of your harvest, nor shall you glean your vineyard, nor shall you gather the fallen fruit of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the needy and for the stranger, I am the Lord your God. So you said there, leave it. For, for others, we're not talking about about bad things. We're talking about you know these are good things. Um, so knowledge of, of, of and once again, people would say, what about where, where God said to you know to kill those among you like the spiritists and all these different things? Christians are called to do the exact same thing today. We're not when there's someone in our congregation who claims to be of the body, okay, claiming to be of the body, and they. Uh, they they don't obey they don't uh, they don't live God's way. We're supposed to you know um, talks about Paul talks about this. There's that dis that discipline that comes, um, which is a little bit of a discussion for another day. Uh, but then also it was to give object lessons in Leviticus five six. Um, he shall also bring his guilt offering to the Lord for his sin which he has committed, a female from the flock, a lamb or goat, as a sin offering. So the priest shall make atonement on his behalf for his sin. Now we know that Jesus is our high priest, but he's also the sacrifice. So that makes him, means that he's always standing as a mediator before us, and his sacrifice was en enough once for all, for all people and for all time, um, for, those of, for those who would, who would, who would accept. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 12 says, Don't be like Israel who did this and this happened, who did this and this happened. And it goes through taught, showing, how, and showing how it was object lessons for us. Um, 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is, and is inspired and profitable for teaching and for training up. Hebrews 5, um, 1 through 10 says, 
for every high priest taken from among men is appointed on behalf of men and things pertaining to God in order to offer um, offer things um, offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins so he's talking about the way that God, Jesus is the high priest um, and really Hebrews talks again and again about the superiority of Christ um, so the New Testament assumes knowledge of the Old Testament and it builds on that and so to say that we don't need the Old Testament is just honestly a little bit naive because the New Testament assumes that you know the Old Testament Does that make sense so um, so then the Ten Principles of Life, um, often called the, the, the Ten Commandments. Um, first off, these were things that would have would have given a good society and would have had them on good terms with the Lord. Um, the first ones have to do with, with, with their relationship with God. The last ones, the last six, have to do with their relationship with people. Um, so once again, all of the law can be summed up in love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. First off, no other gods. Second off, um, no idols. Um, and third off, God's name in vain. Now, remember, God's name in vain isn't necessarily saying God, you know, um, although that's, you know, would be bad too. God's name in vain is also um, taking his, taking, um, taking, a, taking it in vain. You know, like, for instance, you could say that, that, that someone who committed to Christ and then left would be taking his name in vain in a way. Um, it, it also, uh, if, you, if, you, if you swear by his name, that would be taking his name in vain. Um, you know, it's a lot broader than, than, than that. Actually, think about that, taking God's name in vain. And, and see how it, I'm sure if you react with it a little bit, you'll, you'll kind of um, come to a more full understanding of it. But it is definitely not just simply saying you know, what we've made it in, in pop culture today. Um, you know, as the Lord lives, I'll do this. Well, unless you die, unless this, unless that, you know what I mean? There's just so many ifs in that sentence. Um, and then, and then um, following him with half a heart and that kind of stuff, you know, it's the idea of taking God's name in vain. Um, so, okay. Um, that takes us to the Sabbath, that they're supposed to, that they're supposed to have, have a Sabbath. Um, you know, religion really does give a society um, morals. I mean, regardless of your opinion of religion, I, apart from apart from from a claim of divinity, why should we? Why should we? Why why should I live according to what you say is right? See what I mean? But with the Old Testament, we see okay, and it's not about what I think is right; it's what God thinks is right. Um, and, and so, and, and I that, but the thing with the Old Testament uh, is the laws are, God gives some principles, but he gives a lot of application. So don't do this, this, and this. Well, why? Because when you do that, you're worshiping another god. Don't do this, this, and this. Well, well why? Because when you do that, um, you, are, you are in essence taking my name in vain. You know, and, and so the, he goes through these different things, and, and he, gives us, he gives us principles, you know, um, this is how to live holy, but then a lot of it is application. And so what we try to do is we try to take the application of God's principles and say this is a timeless principle, and it applies to all generations. It even applies to Christians. And what we are actually doing is we're making, we're overburdening somebody and making them trying to make them Jewish. And I mean this is not a good thing. Um, so the next one, honor parents. Honor means to think highly of. Um, no, don't don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't covet. Now that last one is kind of all encompassing. If you're not, you know, um, desiring something else that you don't have, chances are it's going to keep you from a lot of these other things. So, um, love your neighbor. Um, so, the different kinds of, of of offerings. There's the burnt, cereal, peace, sin, and guilt. Now these historically have been a little bit. Hard, so I'm going to kind of re um, retranslate them here. Burnt is, is an is an entreat uh, is to entreat a response or to purify the altar. Okay, so um, if you're seeking after the Lord, you give him a burnt offering. For instance, um, if you if you give an if if you're you're wanting and getting ready to offer other sacrifices, you do a burnt offering um, to purify the altar. Um, then there's what's called the cereal, um, and this is basically the burn the version of a burnt offering for the poor. Okay. Um, then there's there's what's called the peace of the fellowship op uh, offering. This was an uh, occasion for unity. Let's say um, that it was a day of festivals or whatever. You would give a peace offering and you would give a burn you would give a burnt offering and then you give a peace offering. 
Um, then there's the um, the sin or the purification offering. It, traditionally, it's been called the sin offering, but this isn't very accurate because it it's more of to purify the sanctuary. The, the sin offering is given to purify the sanctuary. For instance, after a woman has had has had a baby, according to the law, Leviticus 12, um, she has to give a sin offering. So, is it sinful to have a baby? No, not at all. It's talking about purification. In, in fact, I think purification is a, is a way better substitute for that word. Uh, purification offering. Um, if you go back to the word, it's pretty kind of explains itself. Um, but then there's a guilt offering, which addresses a breach of faith or sacrilege. Okay. So um, when the when the holy is used for the profane. And so uh, the question to ask yourself throughout these is, is whose perspective is being shown in this section, God or man? And as you read, just ask yourself that. Is this from God's perspective or is this from man's perspective? And if you're unsure, the New Testament will oftentimes clarify, um, clarify that for you. So <clears throat> the laying on of hands was a symbol that the animal was dying in place of your deserved sin, not that the animal was taking away your sin. And that's why it could never it could never be enough, um, because somebody deserved to die, and so they killed the animal instead of you. Um, so, um, some differences in the sacrifices. Um, Israel used burning sacrifice by fire, which isn't that big of a deal. Uh, pagans read the animals, like they take their 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 intestines and different things like that, and they they prophesy according to that. Um, they take it as different signs and that kind of stuff. Um, Israel's sacrifices were because of the covenant. See, because God was in covenant with Israel, they offered sacrifices. They didn't offer sacrifices to get the God's favor to this or that. Although that is true, um, they uh, the, the the sacrifices were because were a direct result of the covenant. Um, Israel had idea of holiness. This was this was definitely not so much the factor um, with the with the other pagan. Um, pagan belief systems. In the laws of Dadusha Vishnuna, it says, if a man brings the bride wealth for the daughter of a man, but another without the consent of her father and mother abducts her and then de deflowers her, it is indeed a capital offense. He shall die. If a man marries the daughter of another man without the consent of her father and mother, and moreover does not conclude the uh, nuptial feast in the contract for her father and mother, should she reside in his house for even one full year, she is not a wife. If he concludes the contract and the nuptial feast for her father and mother, and he marries her, she is indeed a wife. Uh, the day she is seized in the lap of another man, she shall die, she will not live. If a man should be captured or abducted during a raiding expedition or while on patrol, even should he reside in a foreign land for a long time, should someone else marry his wife, and even should she bear a child, whenever he returns, he shall take back his wife. If a man repudiates his city and his ma master and then flees, and then someone else uh, marries his wife, whenever he returns, he will have no claim to his wife. If a man should deflower the slave woman of another man, he, he shall waste and wait and deliver uh, 20 shekels of silver, but the slave woman remains the property of her master. So, once again, you just see a lot different between the laws of Tadusha of, of Ishnuna and, um, and Israel's. Israel had the idea of holiness. It wasn't about what what one king understood to be right or wrong. It was about what God himself revealed as as what kept people from fellowship because it was evil. So, um, the feasts that are important for us to know about are the Day of Atonement. Um, this was for forgiveness. Hebrews 9, 11 through 12 talks about this. The one day of the year where they went to the Holy of Holies. Um, and then there was a Passover, which was um, God's salvation. Um, to remember God's salvation and also to proclaim um, the coming Messiah, um, which once again we don't do because the Messiah has already come. So 1 Corinthians 5. up there. It's a Okay. Um it's not five seventeen, it's five seven. 
Uh, clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are in fact um, uh, unleavened. For Christ, our Passover, has also been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. <sighs> so, um, other feasts, uh, days of worship, kind of self-explanatory there, and they kind of always say, you know, what what their what their purpose is and how they are to be done. So you can kind of read through Leviticus and whatnot for those ones. Um, then there's the Sabbath, which is the day of worship. Now remember, the Sabbath was not meant to be a day of doing nothing. The Sabbath was meant to be a day of worshiping the Lord. Uh, I know throughout history it's been made out where you can't do a single thing on, on the Sabbath, but that's just wrong. Uh, 14, 5 through 6 says, um, One person regards one day above another, another regards every day alike. Each person must be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it for the Lord, and he who eats does so for the Lord, for he gives thanks to God, and he who eats... Um, who eats not for the Lord, uh, he does not eat, and gives uh, thanks to God. So once again, the Sabbath isn't, once again, we're not, you, you don't, you, it doesn't necessarily work the same anymore. Even with the Sabbath, which, I mean, we've still, the church still is, you know, become, the church still today is a stickler about the Sabbath. And the whole, the, the funny thing is, 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 you know, once again, Paul already talked about this, that, we don't have to um, follow it so legalistically anymore. Um, so man and meat, I talked about this. Um, God gives uh, different qualifications for eating meat. First off, in Genesis 1, 29 through 30, he says not to eat meat. That Well, he doesn't say not to eat meat, but he doesn't say that it's for them to eat. But then in 9, 1 through 7, he says, okay, now you can eat the meat. And then in Leviticus 17, 1, 11 through 4, 14, he gives conditions for eating the meat. So it seems as though um, some, what it equals out to is they couldn't eat a, a, a car carnivorous uh, a animal. They, um, because the preservation was an issue, there they couldn't. Um, they they were con um, limited in, in what they could do with 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 uh, the meat. And then also um, the content of the meat itself. For instance, pig um, is is very uh, filthy kind of meat. It's got a lot of you know. If you eat a lot of pork, you you know, toxins enter your body, and I mean that's discussion for another day. But um, you know, so it seems like the content was an issue as well. Uh, also, keep in mind that pigs will eat pretty much anything, and you know, then you put that in you. So, um, law was the law was given ahead of time for obedience, not for salvation. Um, Matthew five seventeen says. That do not think that I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. See, Jesus is the fulfillment um, of those things. He's the fulfillment of the law. Um, Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9 uh, says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up, um, and so on and so forth. And in 7, 7 to 11, the Lord did not set his love on you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any of the peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But because the Lord loved you and kept the oath which he swore to your fathers, uh, forefathers, the Lord brought you out by a mighty hand, and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful one, who keeps his covenant and his loving kindness to a thousandth generation with those who um, who love him and keep his commandments. But repays those who hate him to their faces. To destroy them he will not delay um, with him who hates him. He will repay him to his face. And uh, then 17, uh, 14 through 20. You shall not uh, move your neighbor's boundary marker, um, which, I'm sorry, I think I'm 17, I'm sorry, 19, I, I meant 17, 14 through 20. When you enter the land which the Lord your God gives you, and you possess it and live in it, and you say, I will set a king over me like all the nations who are... Um, who are around me, you shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses, 
one from among your countrymen you shall set as king over yourself. So there's a few things. First off, God knew that they were going to eventually reject him. Second off, God wanted to be the one, and said this, that he's going to be the one who, who decides who's king. Um, and then also, uh, a lot of the things mentioned here in the, in the passages are exactly what Solomon did. You, you weren't supposed to go and get your horses from Egypt. You weren't supposed to um, uh, accumulate many wives. You weren't supposed to um, make silver or gold too common. Uh, you go through there and you list, list the different things, and um, it's everything that Solomon did. So um, with these, when you're going through the, through, through the uh, laws, how you understand them is you take, discover the principle. What is the principle of, of what he's saying? And then make a new application. Leviticus 19.13, for instance. You shall not oppress your neighbor nor rob him. The wages of a hired man are not to remain with you all night until morning. What is the principle there? When somebody does work, they're worthy of the pay. When somebody does work for you, for you, you pay them. See what I mean? Um, so there, you've made a principle. You've drawn out the principle that you do not, you do not refuse to pay someone who's done work. work. And there's, there's a new application. So, um, we'll talk more about that in another class that I'll be posting within the next uh, few months, and that's called Understanding the Bible. Um, I, I just realized the other day that I've been posting stuff on the on my YouTube under the name Understanding the Old Testament, but it's called The Old Testament Made Easy. So I'm going to have to go and change that. Um, some, the some themes of the law. First off, God is sovereign. God is the one in control of all this. Second off, history. You're seeing, you know, the law contrasts with other laws. The law, con the sacrifices contrast with other sacrifices. And what's going on historically um, at the at the time it is, is you know um, hinted towards and and and, and whatnot. Um, also, uh, the fallen condition of humanity that this is something that 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 God is a temporary solution for for people to be in right relationship with God. Um, salvation and deliverance are, are are two main themes. Uh, the hol holiness and the law that's a major theme. Uh, election uh, that they didn't do anything uh, to pick it. To pick for God to pick them, but God still picked them, you know. Um, but then also uh, the promise, um, the promise and the covenant. You know, it's interesting to note that 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 with Israel, God made God kind of elected them, like you know, picked them out and picked them up and said, "You follow me." Whereas with um, nowadays, it kind of works the exact opposite. Not to say that God doesn't elect. I'm not saying anything like that, but. Um, you know that pretty much the door is open for any who would believe. You know, God's made it so easy now. Um, in fact, He's made it easier and easier. This great chasm has almost no distance between it at all. None that one drop of blood can't resolve. Um, so then, also some other themes are the promise and the covenant. You know, God's faithfulness to all these different things. Um, read through the read through the laws and and and, and try to try to see that they are still relevant. Um, if if maybe a different way, yes, but they are still relevant. So I hope you enjoyed this lesson. Um, next lesson will be about um, uh, talking about the kingdom of Israel going from Saul to Hosea. Hosea. Hosea.